it's uh, my pleasure now to uh, to introduce you Dr. Yasmin Amadzada, a postdoctoral research associate at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. Uh, Dr. Amadzada completed their PhD last year at King's College London, exploring ways in which anxiety and depression run in families and connected with Saj after speaking on the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health podcast. Dr. Amadzada has been supporting efforts to raise awareness in mental health research over the past year, and I'll kindly hand over now for the next 30 minutes. Over to you, Yasmin. Thank you. Um, I've just clicked to share my slides. Having told you that would all be fine, it's now. <laughs> oh, great. So can you see the, the slide view? It's just came through the now, yeah, it was buffering away and it just pulled through the now, Yasmin. Oh, cool. OK. Um, it looks different, but this is better. It shows me my slide, all of them. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me um, and for putting all of this together. I'm a mental health researcher at King's College London, um, and I've split my talk into kind of three sections um, to talk about um, sorry, four sections, to talk about diversity and mental health research. Um, and I'll just go straight straight into it. So first, just with some recent context. So um, events last year, as everyone knows, led to, oh dear, it's really buffering, led to um, protests and um, anger and heightened awareness around the world about racial inequality. And um, lots of white people um, trying to actively educate themselves on the lived experiences of people who experience racism. And as a result, lots of big institutions published commitments to tackling racism. So well, the Wellcome Trust is one um, big institution in my field of um, human research. And in amongst all of this last year, as we all will have had, was um, my personal journey. And one thing that um, was affected for me was I had a paper that was ready to be published. So um, I researched how mental health problems run in families and I'd conducted this um, systematic review of the literature and it was almost ready to go in an American journal when they had a new policy that kicked in, which was that they wanted me to uh, talk about the diversity of the people who were investigated in the research that I'd reviewed, which is um, a really important thing that I hadn't really thought about putting in my papers before and I guess it's an easy excuse to say that I'd never really been told to. So the journal had this policy and I had to go back to the papers and look at who the participants um, or how they um, identified their diversity and to be honest it was a mess because every paper said something different about who the participants were for example um, some talked about participants' race or the country that they came from or the nationality, and some papers didn't say anything. So systematically going through the literature and trying to look at who's actually being studied was complicated. And essentially, I found that uh, um, over 90% of the really big sample of families in this research field um, were white. And um, I... I'm, I'm working in trying to understand mental health risk and what this really highlights is that our, our work in academia at universities at least is being conducted on a very homogenous group and this is um, lots of the work I do is also looking at genetics and big populations and you can see that for example in twin research it's mainly restricted to high income countries with white majority societies and in um, work to understand the genetics of mental health um, has predominantly been done with people of European ancestry. Um, and so I think we all agree that this is a problem, um, especially given that we know that there are group differences in mental health risks. So, for example, across populations or different groups, um, there are differences in your risk of experiencing a mental health problem and um, the service that you'll receive and the um, usefulness of that service for your mental health problem. Um, and I think that this inequity in our research, especially in academia, kind of links back to our historical context. 
So these three men are um, considered the founding fathers of the field that I work in, in statistics and the study of human differences and genetics. Um, and they were the first to measure and quantify variation in humans, at least in mainstream science that we know today. They looked at the relationship between human characteristics and tried to predict characteristics beyond human variation, which is what I work on now. And they, they classified and ranked humans. And many of you might know that these men were all eugenicists. And their work looked something like this. Um, and their work was used to um, invent distinct races to legitimize unequal treatment between groups and it dates back to um, colonial times and the slave trade um, and we now think of this work as a pseudoscience and i think a good way to emphasize how pseudosciencey their work is is um, with this example so even who is included as white changes over time so in the 1920s in America, the courts could determine who was white and who was not. Um, and the Irish and Italian and Polish were originally excluded from being white. And the Armenians won their case to be reclassified as white because a scientific witness claimed that they were scientifically Caucasian. The Japanese couldn't be classed as white because they were scientifically mongoloid. Um, and the Indians, um, were classed as scientifically Caucasian, but they could not be legally white because the court ruled that being white had to come with a common understanding of the white man. So basically white people have in across history have always got to decide who it can be count as white and who is not. Um, and as a side note, I just always want to flag this word Caucasian because it's used still quite a lot in my field of research. Um, because I think lots of people think it's a kind of sciencey way of saying white, but it's not. It's a um, pseudoscientific term that dates back to the time of eugenicists, and we need to stop using it. So um, the work of eugenicists um, kind of legitimised many um, genocides across the 20th century, um, and this one is one that many of us um, talk most about. And after World War II, science learned at least one lesson, um, according to Angela Saini in her book, that if human variation was to be studied, it had to at least try and appear to stay away from politics. But I'd argue that our work is still really deeply embedded with politics, um, and I'll just talk through why. So um, these are the categories that the UK government currently advises that we use to measure ethnicity in human populations. And um, these are outdated and they're not, they're unsystematic and they were not designed for research. And I'll just talk through why. So many people who have to um, identify themselves on these categories can only do so by skin colour. So the categories use some racial terms, um, mainly black and white. Um, some people are identified under large continents, so Africa and Asia. Um, and just to, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I just wanted to highlight that Asia goes from kind of Turkey all the way down to New Zealand. So everyone in this third of the world is um, lumped together and South America, it doesn't feature at all. Um, there are some smaller geographical areas, so the Caribbean, for example, and England, Scotland, Wales, this is linked to our colonial past. Um, some nationalities, again, linked to the British Empire. Um, there are two or three cultural groups only, no others. And anyone who's had experience of trying to navigate this mixed group, um, I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous, really. Um, you can be white and Asian, but you can't be black and Asian. Um, it's a combination of skin colours and, um, well, crude skin colours and geographical areas. But most of or many of us will have had to um, identify ourselves on the census data or on the census survey this year. Um, and one good thing that this does give us even though the categories are flawed, that other countries don't collect, is that we can then, by identifying the identity of um, people in the country, we can start to examine the lived experiences of people across marginalised groups. 
And this is something that we've seen a lot in the past year because we've seen headline after headline about um, differences in um, risk of transmission and death and differences in um, vaccine uptake among people from marginalised groups. And you'll see I've, I've picked all headlines that use this BAME acronym. Um, luckily, or thankfully, um, this is one starting to go out of fashion to use this acronym. And it was um, something that the, um, the Race Commission recommended we stop using, maybe one, the only good recommendation that they had in that report from this year. Um, but I thought I'd just take a minute to explain why this label and this can be applied to many clumping labels um, also isn't useful. So, so BAME or BAME is a UK term and it comes from our census data. So it's a way that we aggregate um, the, the information from our census data. And it's made for really snappy headlines, um, which is a problem because that then enters social discourse and many people don't really know what it means. And I think me and many others included assume that BAME stands for um, anyone who's non-white in data sets. Um, but actually, um, actually, um, it also includes it includes any minority ethnic group. So that includes white anyone who identifies as white other. So it includes white Americans, white Australians, um, and this. Um, this term doesn't help to address racial and discriminatory issues and actually no sweeping clumping label could do that. Um, there's no such thing as a BAME or BAME community. Um, and this lack of specificity in the way that we describe people's data or um, scientific results that re may relate to them, it's, it's othering and it reduces and dehumanizes the people whose data is included there. So really what we need to do um, in research and um, and uh, I guess in other um, organisations is to disaggregate labels and be specific. I guess this links back to the previous conversations about um, being specific with different languages. Um, so, so in terms of using people's data, who's represented in your data and who are your results going to serve and who are they not going to serve? And we need nuance in these questions. And you might think that it's easier said than done to find this nuance because, OK, we can all agree that black Africans are not a homogenous population, but neither are populations within African countries. For example, Uganda has many, many different ethnicities living within one country. Um, so identity is extremely complex. And I think in research, our job isn't to... Um, isn't we don't need to solve that but it's really important also that we don't obscure that complexity so if i go back to these categories um i think that these categories or the these measures of identity make it really easy for us to perpetuate racist narratives and to misrepresent and exclude groups and they also make it easy for us to reinforce white supremacy so defining white as the norm or the human standard and others as deviation from that norm and I um, think that this quote is a good way to reiterate that I think so long as we're using these categories that um, come from a past that we want to move forward from, we're not going to be able to um, improve our methods until we change. Um, well, we're not going to be able to improve our research until we change these methods that we're using. And I'm not going to um, say how we should be measuring um, identity because that's a really big question that lots of people need to come together to think about and to put proper time and effort into working on and um, I just want to say that people have been trying to raise that alarm on this for so long I mean the, these papers date back um, years and even this year there's been more um, people trying to raise this alarm so yeah it's not it's no, by no means just me um, so I um, got some. I'll talk now just a bit about what we can do with our data and terminology in the meantime, um, while we're we're working to try and come up with um, better solutions. So um, there's no one size fits all in what terminology we should and shouldn't use, but it's really important that every time we're we're using these, um, we're trying to define people's identity, especially in big samples. 
um, is to, to direct our terminology to the theory or question or context that we're working in, be really specific. So what information do you actually need to know about the people who you're working with um, or what information do you have? And is it relevant for you to know about um, how they would identify their race or their ethnicity or their ancestry? And I think that these words are often um, used interchangeably, but they are they do mean different things and they shouldn't be used in place of one another. So I'll just outline what these three terms or variables in research, as we would call them, um, actually mean. So race terms um, date back to the time of eugenics and colonialization, um, and they're typically associated with physical characteristics like hair um, texture or skin color. Um, but they're still really relevant today and they still affect people's lives today, um, still part of our social discourse. So, and they're related to, um, for example, access to good healthcare and education, housing and good nutrition, a safe um, and um, protected environment and work um, opportunities and money. Um, and where you are in the world, um, Race terms differ depending on where you are. So you might be considered black in one place of the world and considered white in another. So um, race terms are socially constructed and they depend on the social environment that you're in. Um, ethnicity, on the other hand, is um, more to do with people's cultural expression and identity. Um, so it's so it's more related. They're more related to shared factors like language and traditions and religion. And as with race, ethnicity is a social construct as well. So there's no standard um, agreement on who's in what group. There's no set number of groups. And um, only I can really tell you how what I think my ethnicity is. Um, ancestry, on the other hand, typically relates to the geographical or origin of populations. So it's considered the most objective of the three defined terms, but it's not without flaws because Populations are never homogenous in their ancestry. So people who come from China, for example, are not categorically different from people who come from Mongolia. Um, genetic diversity is continuous across, across populations. It's not categorical. It doesn't sit within the borders that we place around areas. So once you've thought about what's really what you're really talking about in terms of diversity or um, people's identity, um, it's important to think about whether you can talk about nuanced groups or whether you're really talking about majority versus minority split, because at least in mental health research, this is what most of our data sets look like at the moment. Um, and rarely do we ever get people talking about who is actually represented in each of these in this minority um, category and what do we actually have statistical power for. So. Whose data can we actually use to give um, valid results in science? And it's something that we should be um, really emphasizing in our papers and talks and um, teaching that, that really isn't mentioned very much at the moment. Um, and I think that if we um, all start to emphasize this kind of this inequity in um, I say mental health research, but I think health health care health research more broadly, then we can really make a better case for getting the funding um, to do research in different samples with the different populations. Um, it's also important to think about whether the data that we have represents people's self-defined identity or society's perceived identity of them, because these things are not always the same. And remember that these definitions are context specific. Um, so, yeah, why should we care and what, what else needs to happen? Um, so I know that there are different look, people with different backgrounds in the audience, but for people who work in research and healthcare, um, we're in positions of power because our work is designed to generate knowledge and um, to influence policy in healthcare and policy in healthcare affects people's lives. And obviously this is something again that we've seen play out this year. It's when these um, our kind of theoretical work becomes serious because science and healthcare professionals have been put on a pedestal this year um, and expected to know the answers to questions that they work on and expected to have done a good job. And so this is the department where I work at King's College London. Um, 
and really it's our work and it's our moral obligation and duty to be thinking about these questions more. Um, so when our samples are looking something like this and we're using um, acronyms that people don't really understand and variables that we don't really know how to measure properly and words that date back to times that we don't think we're associated with and um, work that really was, we're doing genetics research, which was derived from e eugenicists, um, that I think we need to be raise, raising the alarm more loudly. Um, and I talked about how um, make, right, raising more awareness about these issues can help to get more funding and do things um, in different groups, but also to make science fairer um, and to rebuild trust with communities who don't actually engage with our research. So, um, yeah, it's also interesting to think about other ways in which we communicate with these um, with different groups, as was talked about earlier in the conference. Um, and yeah, this is something, again, that's played out this year where um, we've seen mistrust of science um, and the COVID-19 vaccine across different minority groups. Um, so I think that we need to generate new awareness, um, we need new research protocol and we need to generate new data. And this needs to be done in collaboration with um, different communities um, who help to um, ask the right questions that are relevant to um, their communities to help draw the right conclusions and um, stop people, um, especially in research, from regurgitating the same old information and opinions. So um, this is my last point, but just going back to my research, which is about parent child mental health and has been conducted predominantly with families who are white. Um, so if I think about what what needs to happen next, um, I've been thinking about, well, how would um, my findings differ across families um, who grow up with more extreme environmental stresses such as racism? Um, and a mental health organisation has recently run focus groups with young people to talk about the effects of racism and mental health. And um, I think these kinds of experiences that young people grow up with, like having, um, for example, one young person highlighted being having to be careful about what they say in different environments or being told how to enter certain situations. Um, Th these kinds of lived experiences are being missed out of mental health research at the moment and um, they're not being considered. And I think that this panorama, um, I can't remember when it came out, but it will still be on iPlayer, about racism in the UK really raised, um, in terms of my research, lots of important considerations about how parents and how parent-child relationships are affected by racism. Um, so, yeah, that was all that I had to say. Um, oh, I think there, there was one more quote that's going to come up, but maybe it will come up after a lag. But um, yeah, thank you for listening. No, oh, thank you, Yasmin. Uh, are you OK if we open up for, for questions? Is that yeah, all right? of course. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, uh, same process, people. If anyone's got any questions, if you could just raise your virtual hand and we'll look to, to come to you to unmute you. Thanks for the comments. <laughs> I think one thing that, that resonated with, with myself as well is um, hearing speaking to people with lived experience and who've been working in this field for a long time now, is how do we use what you've kind of discussed to avoid falling back into the same areas where we've been 20 years ago? I think that's what I've heard a lot. You know, we're 20 years on, we're still in the same position. Is there anything that's jumped out of your research that could how to eradicate that or support that you know movement of change moving forward? I mean, I think that I I mean I've come obviously just come to this at a place where I've just finished my PhD and I'm catching up way too late on what has been going on for years and years in research. And what I'm realizing is that loads of people have basically just been doing what I'm doing, which is being like, hello, there's a problem, but not many people have um developed concrete ways of trying to solve, well, trying to move forward with finding solutions to this really complex problem of how do you work with diversity um, in populations. So yeah, I think finding, finding concrete action rather than talking around the problem. Um, don't know if that really answers your question. <laughs> well, that, that makes sense. It does. It does. Thank you. I think we've got uh, another 
question, I think. Uh, Marsha, would you like to come in there? Yes, please. Um, can I just say, interesting, fascinating talk, so thank you very much. Um, my question is, because it is so valuable, and you're applying it really to research, when in all honesty, it is so broad, and it really should be an everyday consciousness, is there anything you think we should all be doing to help that bit happen? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's definitely in my personal life, so outside of research, I think so much more about the language that I use and what I'm actually talking about when I talk about diversity. And you notice way more people saying BAME or like, um, I think I'll, I, I know that it's, it's not just about terminology and you can waste a lot of time talking about terminology but I think we are all very sloppy in the way that we talk about groups and we talk about identity and I think even saying something as as simple as someone who identifies as whatever rather than just saying they are that um um or like what if you're talking about um marginalized groups what do you actually mean by marginalized do you mean people who experience racism or people who experience I, I just think being a bit more specific and um, helps and that maybe will lead us towards developing um, more systematic methods of how we kind of measure and talk about this in different fields. But when I listen to you, what I hear you suggesting is a sort of almost going back to the simplicity of black, brown, white, um, and things like that. Do I have that right or not? Do you mean that we should go back to the simplicity of that? Yeah, is that, is that what you're suggesting? I don't think so, because I'm not, I don't, I, I think what I'm suggesting is thinking every single time what you're talking about is um, thinking about what is the most useful definition to use in this setting. So okay. perhaps in some settings you are talking about black, brown, white, um, as in like that's the way that people have seen on the street, for example, as a, a black person. Um, but in research, I don't I don't think it's useful. Like, for example, in Brazil, they say black, brown, white, but they also have another colour, which yeah. is vanilla for the colour of the envelope. And it, yeah. it's just ridiculous for any other scientific variable. We wouldn't be just I don't know, matching people to a colour of an envelope. So, so yeah, I don't think I'm saying go back to simplicity. I just think be really specific about what you mean in each context. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcia. I think we've got another question from uh, Julie Hogarth. Are you able to see that? As we know, do you need to read that out? Um, yeah, I can see it. So cool. lots of questionnaires and funding forms and racism and relevant. Julie, do you mean um, when you're applying for funding and they're asking you about your identity? Um, because I do think that I mean I don't I don't know I don't know if I'm really the best person to talk about this off the cuff because I haven't thought about it much. But I I do think that it's important to um, monitor who is applying for jobs and to see what pool of people that you're reaching and. For example, um, I'm advertising a job at the moment, which is to work on mental health research and racism. And I would prefer to hire a team who um, have lived experience of belonging to communities who experience racism. So I think that I, it's important to ask people um, to, to talk about this in applications. Um, but it kind of goes in, it goes off into kind of um, positive recruitment. Actually, we have had a talk at university recently um, about debiasing recruitment and um, rather than affirmative action of trying to purposely pick people from their forms who um, have identified as belonging to different groups, they, they suggest having completely blinded application forms but getting rid of cover letters and CVs and using only um, work based questions that people have to answer and then screening the question answers um, 
in a reshuffled way. So you don't read someone's whole application in one, you read everyone's answer to the first question, then everyone's answer to the second question, then score them. And um, that's a way of reducing bias in recruitment. So perhaps I think I would defer to people who are more experienced in recruitment, thinking about this for recruitment, but um, sorry for just thinking while speaking. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's fine. And, and yeah, I think, um, Diversity and recruitment could probably be a session in, in its own right, to be fair. But uh, no, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Jasmine. Uh, I am going to close uh, any future questions uh, for the now, just because I'm really conscious of time. Uh, we're just after half past 12. So thank you, Jasmine, for joining us this morning.